And those of you who are parents in the room know that the best thing you can do for your child is to not give them everything they want, right? Kirsten Sinema is not one of the parents in the room. Note to Senator Sinema's speechwriters, most parents are not open to parenting advice from politicians who are not parents. In fact, they're not open to parenting advice from politicians, period. Needless to say, Senator Sinema's parenting advice was every bit as bad as you would expect from someone who has no idea what she's talking about. And those of you who are parents in the room know that the best thing you can do for your child is to not give them everything they want, right? And that's important in the United States Senate as well. We shouldn't get everything we want in the moment because later, upon cooler reflection, you recognize that it has probably gone too far. So the importance of the 60 vote threshold is to ensure that no one gets everything they want, that you compromise, that you find that middle ground. And by doing so, you're much more likely to pass legislation that stands the test of time, that will not be reversed when the next party gains power. That's the importance of the 60 vote threshold. Senator Sinema thinks that the 60 vote threshold ensures no one gets everything they want. There is not a single senator in the history of the United States Senate who has gotten everything that he or she wants. Not ever. Senator Sinema did not give a single example of a bill being passed with less than 60 votes that was then repealed when there was a change of power in Congress and the White House. Not a single example of her fear, of her theoretical justification for a voting threshold in the Senate that was not provided for in the Constitution and which defies democracy in a body whose very structure of two senators per state defies democracy. If we were to give in to that moment of wanting just what you want, the reversal that would come in a year or two years would not only be bad for the American body, it'd be bad for businesses, it'd be bad for state and local governments, well, maybe that's why it doesn't happen, except, of course, for tax rates. Whenever Republicans control Congress and the White House, they cut tax rates. And then whenever Democrats regain control of Congress and the White House, they raise tax rates. And so it happens. And the country survives. Senator Sinema wasn't finished. What she had already said about the 60 vote threshold was indefensible. And she is apparently one of those people who likes to follow the indefensible with the crazy, which she did. So not only am I committed to the 60 vote threshold, I have an incredibly unpopular view. I actually think we should restore the 60 vote threshold for the areas in which it has been eliminated already. We should restore it. Yeah, not everyone likes that. Um, <laughs> because it would make it harder. It would make it harder for us to confirm judges, and it would make it harder for us to confirm executive appointments in each administration. But I believe that if we did restore it, we would actually see more of that middle ground in all parts of our governance, which is what I believe our forefathers intended. Well, our forefathers, as she calls them, intended that women never be senators. Our forefathers intended that women never have the right to vote. Our forefathers did not intend for a place called Arizona to be represented in the United States Senate. When the founding fathers were writing the Constitution, the place we now call Arizona was Spain. And the authors of the Constitution expected it to remain Spain. In 1821, when Mexico secured its independence from Spain, the place now called Arizona was in Mexico. And the United States took, when the United States took that land, as the spoils of war, which is how we got Arizona, the Arizona Territory eventually became the 48th state in 1912, pretty late in the game. But that was the same year that a constitutional amendment finally overruled the Founding Fathers and allowed United States senators to be elected by the voters of the state instead of the state legislatures, as the founders wanted it to be. So, if Kirsten Sinema really wants to do 
what she says our forefathers intended. She would be working very hard to take the election of senators away from the people who voted for her and give it back to state legislatures. And she would be staunchly opposed to a 60-vote threshold imposed by the Senate because the authors of the Constitution, who she so admires, were very specific about the Senate conducting all, all business by simple majority vote, except for treaties, which they specified in the Constitution, require a two-thirds vote in the Senate, and conviction and impeachment trials in the Senate, which the Constitution also specifies require two-thirds vote in the Senate. The number 60 never appears in the Constitution, but it seems to live in Kirsten Sinema's imagined version of the Constitution. If a simple majority vote is a dangerous and fickle threshold, for governing in a democracy, then why should only five members of the United States Supreme Court get to decide the final interpretation of the law of the land? Why doesn't Senator Sinema advocate a minimum of a six-vote threshold in the Supreme Court instead of a mere majority? And why is the United States of America the only country that has a 60% threshold to win a vote in a national legislative body? Senator Sinema went to Kentucky to deliver that speech at a government-funded university at a place that calls itself the McConnell Center. Senator Mitch McConnell has effectively purchased the naming rights by delivering federal funding to the university, which of course includes taxpayer money obtained in the much richer states of New York and California. The United States Constitution says that the president shall nominate and with the advice and consent of the Senate shall appoint judges of the Supreme Court. The Constitution does not say that Mitch McConnell shall prevent a nominated Supreme Court justice from even being considered by the United States Senate for its consent as Mitch McConnell did to Merrick Garland in the last year of the Obama presidency. And Mitch McConnell didn't need 60 votes to do that. Today, Kirsten Sinema traveled to Kentucky to celebrate Mitch McConnell's constitutional vandalism and her own relentless ignorance by saying this about Mitch McConnell. While we may not agree on every issue, we do share the same values. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, one of the things that struck me about this from the start is this fake uh, phony pamphlet that they gave these people uh, telling them that they would be taken care of on Martha's Vineyard. There would be jobs. There would be uh, food. There'd be support for them in every way. And that's at a place that really closes down, just about completely closes down by Labor Day because it is a summer resort. And the population disappears there. The jobs disappear there. And Ron DeSantis knows that. Just as there is seasonal work in Florida, there is seasonal work and seasonal opportunity in Martha's Vineyard. And he was sending them precisely at the moment when all of the opportunity in Martha's Vineyard disappears. What, what is your lawsuit uh, alleging and what does it what does it hope to achieve? Well, what our lawsuit alleges is that there was a concerted scheme of misrepresentation which induced our clients to fly. Uh, as you point out, this was not about a humanitarian effort to try and get people to where they needed to go. Uh, this was about a political stunt that Ron DeSantis was trying to pull. It was using our clients as political props, making all kinds of representations about what jobs would be available at the destination, how they'd be looked after, how their children would get educational opportunities. And it turns out it was all just a political stunt. The, uh, these Republican governors want to pretend that the uh, Democratic-run states uh, don't face any of these challenges when, in fact, the state that has the largest number uh, of people uh, coming in is California, a Democratic state. They currently in California have 125,000 asylum hearings that are pending. Uh, in Texas, they have 75,000. So a dramatically smaller number in Texas 
uh, than in California or New York, which has 98,000 of these cases pending in their courts. Uh, what is your experience with the distribution uh, of these kinds of issues around the country? Well, certainly there are pockets all over the country that have uh, substantial immigrant populations. Martha's Vineyard itself, although it has been painted as uh, being a largely white, largely wealthy uh, enclave, in fact, is quite diverse. Um, so again, this was not about uh, helping people and helping people to get where they needed to go. It was about trying to make a political point um, and trying to use our clients as props. And that's what people from across the political spectrum have found so objectionable about this conduct. Unless you've served in combat like John Kerry and a few others, Secretary of State is the hardest job you will ever have. It is a job filled with permanent jet lag from constant international travel and endless worries about the state of the world. Last week was an especially intense week for Secretary of State Anthony Blinken at the United Nations General Assembly meeting all week in New York, where Secretary Blinken spent the week meeting with foreign ministers, prime ministers, and presidents from around the world. On Thursday, he was scheduled nonstop for 14 hours, beginning with an 8 a.m. meeting with five foreign ministers, right through a working dinner scheduled for 7.45 p.m. on transatlantic issues. While Secretary Blinken was doing all of that on Thursday, trying to hold together and encourage allies who support Ukraine's resistance to the Russian invasion of their country, Anthony Blinken's father died. Anthony Blinken's father, whose parents came to this country from Ukraine, died at the age of 96. Your father was U.S. ambassador to Hungary. And as we sit here on Friday afternoon, he passed away last night. And I wonder why you decided to keep such a busy schedule the day after that tragedy in your family? My dad uh, was 96 years old. Um, he was in so many ways my role model. He built uh, a remarkable business, one of the leading investment banks in this country over many years. He led a life of dignity, of decency, uh, of modesty, that is something I've very much aspired to. And so I, I guess I thought that um, honoring everything that he shared with me, the best way to do that was to continue doing my job. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken honoring his father, the Honorable Donald Blinken, by continuing to do his job. 